Um, great, uh, great to have you here, Lina, and great to have you here, Jennifer. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this um, seminar is a continuation from last week's um, Researchers Desk Wednesday lunch. Uh, we talked um, about, broadly speaking, um, alternative economic models or future, future fit economic models and changes in the economic system that we can make. And uh, towards the end of the session, um, one of the most sort of engaging questions, I think, for the discussion has been um, what went wrong with the um, mainstream economics. Um, why, why is there a problem and what is valid and what is probably not so valid? And then uh, Jennifer brought up um, Lena's um, dissertation. And I need to say that we have two quite fresh uh, doctors so big congratulations to the recent um, thesis defenses. Uh, so um, we thought that uh, it would be a great idea to bring in uh, Lena and her um, story to, to the discussion. Um, so Lena Isaks uh, recently um, defended at the KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, uh, with a dissertation on uh, deliberating value, the, so how the valuation of nature is being treated in different economic paradigms. And um, uh, Jennifer will, um, so first we'll give the floor, open the floor for, for Lina to present her dissertation and her thoughts, and then uh, ha hand over to Jennifer to continue and sort of uh, comment on it from her perspective, because her PhD was devoted mostly to the to, uh, non for profit alternatives uh, and the relationship between the ownership structure and the purposes of the company and sort of the orientation for profit, non for profit orientation in relation to sustainability. Um, and then um, we have a few questions that were still unanswered from last Wednesday, and I'm sure there will be more good questions in the discussion. So I'm thinking that about half an hour will maybe uh, devote for the discussion today. Um, and um, yes, we finish uh, 13 sharp. Uh, so, Lina, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. If you want to share some slides, maybe so I can, or I can make you um, yes. co host. Just a second. Yeah. <clears throat> Where do I do that? Um, it's done. Done. Thank you, Toya. Uh, so, you can share the screen and uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, let's see here now. Uh, yeah, so now do you see, do you see uh, a new classical value theory slide? Yes. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I was, um, I sort of took uh, your question, uh, uh, Svetlana, yesterday in the email a bit seriously, uh, where you said that it would be nice to hear my story, uh, which I um, I think uh, Jennifer said uh, last time, because I listened to it afterwards, I didn't see the researchers desk last week, but that you said that it is a sort of a story of how I went from being a neoclassical economist uh, to an ecological economist. And uh, and uh, when I thought of that, how how should I tell? How can I tell that in fifteen minutes and and in a sort of other way than how I do it in the thesis? I thought I, I don't think I can really. So I I decided to just sort of still take it from my thesis story, which is a bit different from how I from other details from how this sort of journey went. And if you're curious about more depth in that story you'll have to ask me afterwards uh, because it's really there are so many layers to it I think uh, but I mean uh, so my thesis is about um, uh, it is about whether it is a good idea to price or monetize nature uh, to make us see it and value it uh, and and sort of change or remedy the fact that we don't see it as having that much value to the economy and uh, underneath all this, um, I, um, 
I, in my thesis, go from how neoclassical economics, neoclassical environmental economics, uh, explains why it is a good idea to monetize nature. And behind it lies a very fundamental uh, theory, the neoclassical value theory, which I uh, think, uh, which I explain in, in the thesis because I think it's so important. And it is part of my story, my, my, my story, my journey from being a neoclassical <laughs> environmental economist to now an ecological economist to understand the fundamental impact of this, this value theory. And I think it's super interesting to, to and important for people to know about it. So I'll try to explain it. And, and it has, um, um, I have a pic on the front page of my thesis, which, uh, which helps us ex uh, understand it. Uh, so it makes some very strong claims, this, this value theory. And, I, and those who have studied neoclassical economics will recognize all these things. Uh, but just like me, I think, didn't really understand how fundamental they are and how they still impact all kinds of uh, descriptive studies and efficiency that is I mean, normative analysis that economists do. It makes strong claims based in what's called uh, utilitarianism, uh, such as that the increasing human welfare that increasing human welfare is the only thing that has value in itself. So it is the only thing that gives us value. And another claim is less sort of known, but is equally fundamental, is assumed in a descriptive sense to consciously weigh costs and benefits of choices in the, in the choices we make. Uh, so we make trade-offs is the assumption. So in that sense, the trade-off idea is very fundamental. It is an idea of how we behave. And what we do is we, we weigh costs and benefits to optimize uh, our welfare as a consequence of the choices we make. So here is, those are ideas of, of that, that this theory claims. And I'll soon uh, explain what, what's interesting with these two. And in this picture that I have on the front page of my thesis is, uh, is, is made by, uh, cartoonist Sara Granier, uh, and I love it because it it describes so well uh, the research problem uh, that I go through and I think yeah that I address in the thesis, and it says in Swedish that här med meddelas att rörsångare som kärsångare utgått ur sortimentet på grund av svag efterfrågan välkommen åter, and it means we hereby inform you that the reed warbler and the march warbler are no longer in stock due to lack of demand. I've, I've um, translated this myself. Please come again, it says. And it might seem like a joke, it, it's fun, but it isn't because, or I mean, it is a very good description, I, I'd say, of, of what is the, the, the implication of if you take uh, neoclassical value theory seriously. Uh, because the market described in this, in this picture actually says that if it would be so that it is lack of demand, that, that, that the lack of demand for these birds uh, are um, not there anymore, and these uh, birds would go extinct, it is actually as it should. And this includes uh, whether, it, it, it includes even if you'd price them as some sort of positive externality or you know, culturally existing services. Uh, with that price, if they go extinct, it is as it should. So there are some things with these two claims here that they are of some different kind. You have a validating claim there that you say, I mean, to say that human welfare is the only thing that has value in itself is obviously normative, a validating claim. And the other one here is a supposedly descriptive or so-called positive claim. So it's an empirical claim, uh, just saying how we are assumed to behave and how things are assumed to be on a fact-based, uh, uh, in a fact-based sense. So, and what is interesting is that these two uh, always um, um, communicate in economic analysis. Um, and I will explain this a bit more. So it, I've, I've um, what I'm, I'm saying here is that the, the basis of the theory 
is that since uh, that the value is human welfare, to increase human welfare. And since human welfare is a subjective experience, so here I've, I've equalized these two, I mean, from value, what is value is human welfare. Uh, but in what's, what's been done in, in, in this theory and by economists, also philosophers also have done some tra transformation of this, these ideas is that, I mean, you can, human welfare is a subjective experience, which is very hard to measure and objectively describe. So in order for it to make it, to make it more useful in, in, in practical analysis, uh, at some point, uh, uh, it was redescribed or reformulated, redefined as so-called preference satisfaction, and that is a more neutral concept. It's empty, and and in the development of of, of neoclassical theory during the last century, uh, it was um, it became the one the container for what is good to do, uh, what what it is that we should instead. Um, both describe what it is that is good and what people are actually doing. Uh, so preference satisfaction is the thing that has value in itself. And by this, economists can say that um, to, to increase preference satisfaction is good in itself, but we don't have to make any claims about what it is actually that is good in itself. So preference satisfaction is, is just a, is, is a more, um, so open concept, presumably less value laden. Um, and in the next step, uh, this, this uh, heuristic, this analysis or this theory uh, draws sort of a equalized uh, preference satisfaction with choice behavior, because how can we study preference satisfaction when it is it, it then became assumed that we can do it through our choices so what people choose uh, is always a good indicator of why of of their behavior when they want to pre to to satisfy their preferences and they do it because of uh, their will to feel better and fulfill their desires and in in a way become uh, happier. Uh, okay, so choice behavior is a good indicator of preference satisfaction and of human welfare and in turn value. And the next step then, uh, just because if we can understand people's choice behavior as a sort of uh, uh, um, um, cost benefit uh, weighing in uh, everything we do, so we always, we are assumed to always um, know uh, the consequences of our actions, and we can uh, um, treat information that we have in our choices, uh, positive and negative outcomes of that. Then, for example, if we in the market um, uh, are, um, or I mean, when we, when we, if we, if we look at choice behavior in that way, we will see that if we change, exchange money for something, we must um, be assumed to think that this uh, piece of, of this sum of money is equally valuable to the thing we exchange it for, otherwise we wouldn't do it. And, and so therefore money is a really good indicator of value of these things. So in this way, uh, willingness to pay becomes a good indicator of, of value. So the idea here is that, that there's some, some rational way of, of, of trading off things where value is, is possible to exchange for other things. So it's a very handy thing to use uh, as for studying and quantifying value. Uh, so this sort of goes around as you see, uh, and, and um, so it explains why money also is seen as an acceptable indicator of, of value. Um, and are you following me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, okay. Uh, so this way of translating everything, I make a, a big sort of point of this in my thesis, is that commensurability, when you explain, when you say that you can measure everything in terms of 
uh, something else that is so so that you can measure everything in terms of one and the same unit means it, it's called commensurability and it's so fundamental in in, in neoclassical analysis. Uh, so it means that you can assume you you can presumably exchange everything for everything else with no loss of of value. And uh, so I call it the trade-off model of choice and value in the theory, just because of this, this fundamental idea of that our behavior is trade-off making, and uh, we equalize it with, with, with choices with value. And it's not me who has come up with this trade-off model of choice and value concept. It's used by others also. Um, OK, so now I talk sort of uh, 12 minutes. Um, 